Okay, so in this video today we're going to be discussing malrotation. Uh, malrotation of the gut is uh, primarily the definition of it is whenever you have uh, a rest of the uh, of the normal gut as it rotates to a normal gut as it rotates uh, around the uh, superior mesenteric artery. Uh, so before we can understand this, you know, it's obvious that we need to go over the embryology of rotation. Uh, so here is um, a few images here which show how the gut is rotating uh, from six weeks down to 12 weeks. So um, at six weeks, uh, what, what begins to happen is the gut starts becoming larger and larger and it begins to penetrate through the uh, yolk sac here. And uh, as, as time goes on, the it continues to get larger this way and so the gut goes goes out into the uh, yolk sac even further around nine weeks you get a rotation so right now this the this inferior side of the gut is at the bottom it's going to move up into the uh, I guess uh, anterior to the proximal side of the gut and so what you're going to get is you're getting uh, immediately you're getting a 90 degree rotation now the rotation, the axis of rotation is actually right here. So this is rotating that way. So in the actual yolk sac, you get about a 90 degree rotation. Then what happens is once you get this 90 degree rotation, the abdomen, the uh, gut will actually go back into the uh, uh, abdomen of the uh, inf uh, the fetus, and it'll continue another 180 degree rotation. So once it goes back, so you've done 90 degrees. So you have a 90 degrees here, and it's going to continue to do another 180 degree rotation. So 90 plus 20 is going to be a total of 270 degree rotation. And so what ends up happening is the cecum ends up uh, being at the right lower quadrant of the uh, fetus. And uh, the, ro the primary air rotation again is the superior mesenteric artery. That's the axis of rotation. So when we're talking about malrotation, we're talking about uh, in, if in anywhere in, of these uh, problems uh, or these areas, there is no uh, rotation or there's incomplete rotation. So there's two types. Um, let's erase that. So there's two types of uh, rotation. So there's going to be uh, non-rotation and malrotation. So in non-rotation, we'll, we'll discuss that first. Uh, the cecum, uh, or the, sorry, the cecum, the uh, gut does not uh, rotate at all, and so what you end up having uh, uh, having is the actual uh, colon is to the left side of the small bowel. So the small bowel is actually on the right side, and the colon is on the left side. Uh, this isn't as serious. We'll talk about uh, reasons why after I discuss the malrotation. So in malrotation, uh, rotation does occur for a little bit. So what, what ends up happening is, what you, when, like I talked about previously, uh, it makes it up to this point. The cecum is at this area here. So it, it rotates all the way up until the cecum gets into the right upper quadrant. However, it doesn't go down any further. So you don't have any downward movement. And so the cecum is uh, uh, going to be in, in here instead of down there. Now, the, the malrotation, believe it or not, is actually more... Uh, is associated with more complications than non-rotation. The primary reason is because of the mesentery, the mesenteric base. So what happens here is if you see this red line here, uh, this red line is highlighting the base of the mesentery. And so the normally it goes all the way from the duodenum uh, jejunal flexure all the way down to the cecum. So you get a wide base and then you know it it uh, kind of goes into the uh, small intestines from here. But with malrotation, it's a very small base here. And so what that means is it's very easy with malrotation for it to spin around on, uh, on, its, on itself. And this can cause a very serious uh, complication uh, known as volvulus. And so what volvulus is, is when it spins around on itself. So I got, a, I got an image here. So you can see here is... Um, the gut is spin so so the mesentery is kind of coming out from behind here and since it's very narrow the gut is able to spin a, a, around it and this volvulus and this can lead to necrosis and ischemia 
And what also tends to occur in malrotation, which makes it more severe, is you get these bands. So these bands right here, uh, these are called the LAD bands. And what this, uh, as you can see, it actually goes, so this is, you know, the, your stomach, and this is the duodenum here. It actually goes over the duodenum and it can compress it and it can cause obstruction. So you do not get any of those in the non-rotation. So non-rotation tends to be more benign. Um, however, with the non-rotation, there isn't really much imaging that can help you uh, see it. Uh, generally, you have to do uh, lap laparoscopically. Uh, whereas uh, with the malrotation, uh, imaging oftentimes can um, help diagnose this. So um, where do you, so I've kind of alluded to uh, concepts here of where the symptoms actually come from. So the symptoms are caused by uh, two main po uh, pathologies. The first is going to be the narrow mesentery that I talked about. So this narrow mesentery here uh, will allow volvulus, uh, this volvulus to occur. And so th um, this volvulus can lead to ischemia and uh, necrosis. And secondly, it's uh, due to the LAD bands. So the LAD bands uh, will cause uh, duodenal uh, obstruction. And so this is where the two symptoms come from. And again, as you can see, in non-rotation, uh, this does, uh, doesn't occur. Um, let's talk about uh, some symptoms that you would find. Uh, so classically, uh, this tends to occur uh, much earlier in infancy. Uh, so in, w what you'll notice is in early infancy, uh, they'll tend to start vomiting. Uh, in particular, there's going to be bilious vomiting. And again, this is due to the du uh, duodenal atresia that often occurs uh, due to that LAD band. Uh, so there's going to be duodenal uh, vomiting, then it's going to be associated with uh, some abdominal pain. And of course, because of the obstruction, there's also going to be uh, some distension as well. Uh, finally, if... Um, if you have volvulus, you begin, you begin to get that complication. Uh, sorry, uh, you can get uh, some bloody stool, and bloody stool is a poor sign. Bloody stool means that now there is some necrosis going on, and there is ischemia. So, uh, a very very bad sign. And you know, oftentimes when you get this uh, bloody stool and necrosis, immediately you want to start thinking of uh, the complication of sepsis, uh, and also you can get. Um, fluid third spacing and so uh, one of the management uh, protocols is to maintain fluids. Um, how often does so uh, and and so of course w if you have uh, this bloody stool here that's going to be volvulus. How often does that occur? Um, in children it occurs about 22% of the time. Uh, in adults it's a little bit more rare about 12% of the time. Uh, in adults uh, it, it also occurs. Um, Again, the, if you've noticed, these are very vague symptoms. Uh, there are a few differential diagnoses that you uh, need to keep in mind. Uh, and primarily with, with this, age is a big factor. So in certain age groups, there are things that are more common. Uh, so in, in the preterm group, if you get this type of uh, you know, bloody stool, abdominal pain, distension, you want to think more of necrotizing enteric colitis. Um, and you could, you could differentiate this by x-ray. X-ray is going to be very typical in uh, necrotizing enteric colitis. And in the older infants, uh, you want to think more along the lines of intussusception, uh, which is when it's like telescoping of the uh, small intestine. And, you know, how do you d d diagnose that on ultrasound? You get that uh, bullseye sign. Uh, so this is the primary differential diagnosis that you're going to be uh, looking at. So what type of uh, investigations uh, would you want to do? Um, the first one that I'm going to talk about here is going to be the x-ray. So um, x-ray is actually not always helpful. Um, you don't, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, you won't see much. Here, let me, uh, let me put up an x-ray here. Uh, this is an x-ray of uh, an actual uh, patient who had uh, uh, vo vo volvulus. Uh, and you, as you can tell, you know, all you can see is just some general gas. Uh, so you can just see some gas, uh, you know, and, and overall it looks normal. What are some diagnostic signs that you can tell? Uh, the first diagnostic sign that would be is say there's an NG tube and it's, it's going into an awkward area into the uh, duodenum. So that just suggests abnormal placement of the duodenum. And when, there's, when you have the LAD signs, uh, the LAD bands, you can get the double bubble sign. And what the double bubble sign is, I, have, uh, I do have an x-ray of that. 
so the double bubble sign isn't necessarily for volvulus. It just uh, suggests uh, duodenal, um, uh, uh, duodenal obstruction. So in double bubble sign, you get a bubble here in the uh, stomach and then another bubble in the duodenum and then there's no gas whatsoever in the rest of the abdomen and so that just is a general sign for some type of duodenal obstruction not necessarily volvulus um, so as you can tell x-rays not too helpful uh, what is actually more helpful is a barium swallow uh, also known as a GI series and so what the barium swallow will do it can uh, you know you have the patient swallow some barium and then you take some uh, x-rays uh, after it and so what you'll notice in the uh, barium swallow is it can highlight the walls of the uh, bowel very very nicely and so it, when there's volvulus you get this classical corkscrew uh, appearance so the classical finding on uh, GI series is going to be the uh, corkscrew appearance uh, and and what you'll also notice is oftentimes uh, there's going to be a misplaced duodenum uh, it can actually highlight that as well, although you can't see it in the image I have. Uh, you oftentimes you can see that. Um, another uh, imaging modality that you can use instead of using a barium swallow, uh, we can use a barium em uh, enema, and a bar barium enema highlights more of the colon uh, rather than the uh, duodenum. So let me get an image here of a barium enema. So here uh, we have. Uh, two barium enemas. Uh, this, uh, on this side we have a normal uh, barium enema and here we have the uh, abnormal. So what are uh, characteristic features? So the first thing, let's, let's kind of talk about the normal first. Uh, right here we have the uh, cecum. So in this area we have the cecum and here we have, this is all the small intestine and here we have the nice, so this is going to be the uh, colon here and then it's going to continue into the small intestine. Well, in a, in a patient with, um, well, this is probably more non-rotation, but uh, you can notice that the cecum is here. And then, you know, here is your ileocecal junction here, and then this, uh, this all here is your small bowel. So you can see that the small bowel is on the right side of the uh, large bowel. So this is the barium enema, and as you can tell, it, it gives you a really good picture of uh, what you're looking at. Um, what you can also do is an ultrasound. Um, Ultrasound generally will, will show you uh, abnormal placement of the uh, duodenum. So the duodenum is not where it's supposed to be. Uh, and you can also get abnormal placement of the uh, superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery. So sometimes one will be uh, anterior lateral to the other. And so that is going to be your classical uh, picture there. And you also get a very characteristic sign called the whirlpool sign. And so the whirlpool sign. Uh, is basically you're looking at the volvulus and so if you look carefully I'm going to uh, outline it so this is the gut wall and so it's kind of going like that okay and so first of all you can notice that the gut wall is very thick and then it's going into here so this is the uh, whirlpool sign so very characteristic sign uh, if, you, if you see it on uh, ultrasound um, you can also do CT scan uh, CT scan is not necessarily preferred with uh, infants and children and adolescents, uh, but in adults it is preferred because uh, it can also t you know show you if there's any perforation, uh, any volvulus, uh, which is you know particular to adults. So this is um, uh, preferred in in this uh, sector of the uh, population. Um, also, so what will you what will you see on CT scan? The same thing. Uh, I mean, you're going to just see an abnormal placement of the duodenum, superior mystic vein, superior mystic artery. These are the uh, primary things that you can find. Uh, now, if, if you've done all this and it's still equivocal, uh, you can do a laparoscopy uh, just to kind of check in there real quick. Uh, and, of course, uh, this is uh, probably the, um, only if uh, it's unequivocal. It's, it's, you're not really sure if they uh, actually have the condition or not. So that's how you work up the patient. Uh, if they do, you know, unfortunately uh, have this condition, uh, how would you treat it? It's a primary surgical treatment. Uh, it's specifically, uh, the procedure is called the LAD procedure. Uh, and so what, what they do here is they, they do a few things. Um, interestingly enough, they actually do not return the bowel to normal position. Uh, what they actually do is they widen uh, 
uh, the mesenteric base and I told you this is the uh, big problem and so uh, because if the mesenteric base is small that can cause vul vulvulus but if you widen it it, it, it's a very low risk of actually having volvulus and again like we discussed before the lad bands are the problem so you, they just cut the lad bands off and so then that leads to urinal obstruction and then you just let the, the uh, child be it's uh, that's all you need to do but during the surgery they do go ahead and do an appendectomy and this is because the uh, the appendix is located in the upper right quadrant and so you know in the future if he does get appendicitis it's very hard to diagnose and so it's a vestigial structure, so they just tend to remove it. So they do do that. And they also want to uh, rule out obstruction. So they generally uh, pass some type of tube through the duodenum to make sure there's no strictures or uh, anything there. What, if, with the lat procedure, what are some adverse uh, effects? The adverse effects is first is going to be short bowel syndrome. And this will only occur if there's necrotic intestine and they removed a lot of the uh, intestines. And so short bowel syndrome what is it you take out too much intestine and so the baby can no longer uh, or the, in, the individual can no longer absorb the enough nutrients required uh, and the other one is it can lead to adhesions uh, in the bowel and that can lead to uh, future obstruction so uh, what is a prognosis um, let's talk about prognosis real quick and then we'll uh, finish this topic so prognosis 89 um, percent uh, will resolve so that's pretty good uh, resolve without any problems uh, what's the mortality rate uh, mortality rate is right around three to nine percent this is actually zero uh, with healthy infants but infants who have uh, you know had necrosis had volvulus or they're premature they had other anomalies they tend to have more of a risk of uh, mortality and uh, the, the, the risk of recurrent volvulus pretty low uh, it's 1.8% to 8 actually 8% so not too much of a risk once uh, the patient is treated